Hello. My task at hand is to talk to you about how I've come to be such an advocate and believer in the use of intravascular ultrasound guided treatment of iliofemoral vein obstruction in those patients who are suffering from severe venous hypertension. These are my disclosures. Let's start off with the case of a patient I took care of who exemplifies quite well why I'm so motivated to find a better way to take care of these patients. This was a 70-year-old woman who was in a wheelchair because of the bilateral leg venous ulcers she had for over a year. She had been seen in the wound center for over three months with no improvement. She had previously been seen by a general surgeon and only got worse under his care. The bandages she had on her legs were soaked from the chronic weeping of her open wounds, such that when she went to the wound center, there were pools of fluid that would accumulate on the exam room floor. This is what her wounds were about the time I met her. You can see the bilateral, large, superficial ulcerations along the entire calf, from the ankle to just below the knee. And what you see on the right side of the slide is what I grew up with as a surgical resident and an early part of my career as a general surgeon and early vascular surgeon treating patients who had venous ulcers. Compression therapy using Uniboots had been the reliable and well-tried technique. The problem is that all too frequently when you have these large venous ulcers, three months after initiating Uniboot therapy, you're left with pretty much the same problem. And maybe if you're lucky, the wounds aren't getting worse, but they're likely not getting much better. In this patient, they were getting worse, so you start to hang your head and wonder, what else can I do? Compression's not working, and that's supposed to be the mainstay of treatment. And then you continue doing what you know to do, because there is not another option that you know of, or, and now you're at six months, you've made no more progress, the patient's coming back weekly, the wounds are weeping, sometimes they get infected, they get debrided, but they're really not healing, they're not getting anywhere, and you start to hold your head and scream, saying, there's got to be a better way. So this is what happened to me back in 2007, and I came to the conclusion, made famous by Albert Einstein, that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I decided that I had to find a different way. I had reviewed an article that Dr. Peter Neglin and Dr. Raju had submitted to the Journal of Vascular Surgery back in 2006, looking at ways of diagnosing and treating venous outflow obstruction to heal the wounds and cure the symptoms of chronic venous hypertension. I thought this really could be a paradigm shift in how we treat patients with advanced venous hypertension, and by 2007, when I wasn't getting anywhere with my patients who had venous ulcers, I decided it was time to jump into the deep end of the pool and try this approach out. The Rosetta Stone, of course, is a translation device for languages. Here is my Rosetta Stone for those of you who don't have a lot of experience treating venous disease. The veins are pipes that carry the blood to the heart from the rest of the body. They are affected by gravity such that blood is going down towards the legs when a patient is upright or sitting because gravity is pulling the blood towards the feet. So we have valves in our veins that are designed to close when the blood is going down towards the feet to keep the blood moving in a net fashion up towards the heart. We have the superficial veins just under the skin, most commonly seen as varicose veins, and then we have the deep veins, which are the main conduit for blood from the legs up to the heart, which are deep in the legs, under the muscle, and deep along the bone. Now you can have vein disease due to valve laxity or reflux, due to outflow obstruction. You can have outflow obstruction due to narrowing or a complete blockage of a vein, either from an acute or chronic blood clot, or from external compression of the vein. Now these are the types of patients that I typically consider treating for outflow obstruction. These are patients who have physical signs of advanced venous hypertension. They may have unilateral leg swelling with skin discoloration, either due to hyperpigmentation as seen in the panel on the left, or stasis dermatitis as seen in the panel in the middle, or they may have pigmentation with frank ulceration. We know that we need to evaluate these patients for outflow obstruction, and based on their original publication in 2002, where they talked about left common iliac vein obstruction caused by compression by the right common iliac artery, Neglin and Raju brought to light that compression of the iliac veins can occur not just on the left, but also uh, can occur on the right, and that intravascular ultrasound is the best way to detect this outflow obstruction. 
These are the findings that they describe. You can see in the circles where the artery can override the vein and narrow it against the spine, causing a compression point, both in the common and external iliac veins bilaterally. The external iliac veins are compressed at the bifurcation of the common iliac artery into the internal and external iliac artery. Neglin and Raju reported evaluating and stenting 332 limbs in 319 patients for non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions. These are compression lesions. They compared venography and pull-through pressures to intravascular ultrasound and found that venography missed fully a third of the lesions that were present and that intravascular ultrasound was greater than 90% sensitive in identifying these outflow lesions. Pull-through pressures had no role in identifying these lesions. In fact, what was really compelling for me from this paper was that at two and a half years follow-up, after stenting, their patients had nearly complete relief of the heaviness and discomfort in their swollen legs, and that those that had venous ulcers, three-quarters of them had healed. And this is a center that has a large referral of venous ulcers. To be able to heal the hardest of the hardest, three-quarters of the time, I thought was quite compelling. They had a follow-up report in 2007, and this is an important paper because what they showed was that with a follow-up in 94% of the patients, with an average follow-up of 22 months and follow-up of almost 10 years in some patients, they saw a very low incidence of thrombosis after stenting. And when you look at almost a 1,000 limbs, this is very significant. Because if you had asked me in 1996 or 97 about stenting the iliac veins, I would have thought for sure you would make them more thrombotic by putting a foreign body in there and create new problems rather than cure problems. But Neglin and Raju proved the opposite. So this is the way we were. We had compression bandages and not much else. And when you start using intravascular ultrasound and stenting, this is what you can progress to. You see these wounds healing. After this patient who I showed earlier had stenting of the external iliac veins bilaterally for significant compression, Both of her wounds went on to heal, and the patient has had no recurrence of her ulcers in the last three years. If we find minimal or no significant superficial vein reflux, then we start to evaluate for outflow obstruction using intravascular ultrasound and venography. These are the patients I've shown you with the seep 3s or greater with advanced symptoms, and we look for greater than 50% cross-sectional area reduction in the iliac veins as the threshold for considering placing a stent to open up the vein. I probably evaluate three or four patients with some degree of swelling or leg discomfort for every one patient that goes to intravascular ultrasound. This is a snapshot of my practice in 2008, shortly after I had started in my current practice, and before I really got underway with significant venous interventions of the deep system. You can see that a significant number of my patients I was treating for superficial vein disease. I had a lot of PID that I was treating. We saw some aneurysms and carotids and a fair number of dialysis patients. But if you look five years later, I still do a large amount of superficial vein work, but the amount of work I do in the deep veins has gone up to 30% of my practice and is steadily increasing as we've developed expertise in this area and become more recognized as an authority in this area. Now, vascular surgeons want to know how IVIS is going to help them identify these patients. How do they pick out the right patients to treat? not only to evaluate for outflow obstruction, but then stent. They know it's a minimally invasive procedure. They understand it's an outpatient procedure. There's not a lot of morbidity or mortality, and that's important to emphasize. When I first came to this field and read about it, I would have thought that we would see a lot of thrombotic complications, but we really don't. Finally, what they have to understand is that most patients that have symptomatic venous insufficiency and are stented for significant outflow obstruction will have significant improvement in their symptoms within weeks to days. An important message for the wound care doctors that may not be vascular specialists is that venous ulcers can be in part due to iliofemoral vein outflow obstruction and that stents can restore normal venous outflow and help venous ulcers to heal faster. In conclusion, in my clinical experience, stenting has been shown to be safe and effective and IVIS helps guide safe stent placement and can lead to a better technical outcome.